wonderful story uh, uh, that you told. You know, don't hold on to anything. We always say, don't make anything. And if you make something, you know, there it is. Don't hold on to it. So it's kind of a two-step dance. Don't make anything. If you do make something, don't be attached to it. Don't always be picking and choosing. So does uh, anyone have uh, a question? Or perhaps I uh, should put it as, does anyone have a topic of conversation? You know, we uh, set this up so that uh, the student asks a question and then the teacher gives the answer. Uh, maybe that's not so good. Uh, so maybe we can have some more uh, give and take, more of a conversation, although I realize that might descend into sheer chaos as well. But does anyone uh, have anything to say? Any question, any comment? Uh, Stan, it's uh, Ting here. Many years ago, when I first came to practice, uh, you were the one who taught me how to bow, coordinate with my breath. And you were the one also taught me how to sit. And you did tell me that if you bow, you become very center. And if you sit, you become very clear and you need both. And I think that's very, very helpful. Whenever I hold on something or I pick something, I was pissed off at anybody. And that sort of practice always kind of eventually got me out of it where I shouldn't be. So could you say something about the practice, all these different form of practice we have? Well, you already said that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I remember um, teaching me how to bow, <clears throat> the bowing in coordination uh, you know, with, uh, with the breath, and uh, pointing out that uh, when we, we bow, uh, we have different forms of bowing, but uh, the essential motion is uh, like revolving around your center of gravity. So you keep doing that. You know, keep doing that, your center becomes very strong. And if you want to coordinate it uh, with your breath, as you go down, you can breathe in. And then, you know, when you're down on the floor, uh, you can breathe out. And immediately you breathe in after you breathe out and you exhale on the way up. Uh, so uh, this breathing pattern coordinates physically very well with uh, the motion you know, that we're making, and with the dynamics of it. So breathe in as you go down. When you're down, breathe out. Right before you get up, you breathe in. When you come up, you, know, you breathe out. So that's, that's very simple. It's not necessary uh, to do that, but I, I think it actually, uh, it's helpful uh, to coordinate uh, the bowing with uh, the breathing. And then when you're sitting, of course you breathe when you sit and you can coordinate uh, your practice uh, with your breath. Um, it's what um, one way or another I've uh, always done. And, um, I usually breathe during sitting in coordination with uh, a mantra. Uh, so the, uh, many of you have heard me describe this, so I won't go on at length, but uh, the chant that we do, Kwan Se Yom uh, is a 32 count uh, chant. Kwan Se Yom Bo Sao, Kwan Se Yom Bo Sao, Kwan Se Yom Bo Sao, and so on. Uh, to the end. So you can uh, breathe in, of course you do, you're doing it silently, so you're not actually using any breath to make the sound, uh, but uh, you can breathe in during the first two repetitions of Kwan Sayum Bo Sa, so that would be for a count of eight. And then you can hold your breath for the next Kwan Sayum Bo Sa, 
so hold for a count of four. And then for the next uh, 16 counts, four repetitions of Kwan Sen Po so a long, complete exhalation, very complete. And as you're breathing out, you can straighten up. It's sort of like a rocket ship, you know, breath goes out, boom, you're more erect. So you can uh, use that dynamic to uh, correct your posture with, uh, with each breath. Uh, and then hold the breath out for the last four counts of uh, Kwan Sen Bo So. Um, so I think I invented this um, on uh, the basis of a kind of a uh, yogic pranayama uh, technique uh, for breath, which has those same uh, proportions of breathe in for eight, hold for four, breathe out for 16, hold out for four. And I simply coordinated that uh, with our Kwan Sai Bo Sal chant, which happens to be, you know, 32 beats. So uh, yoga and uh, Zen practice come together. Why not? So that's what I always recommend for, you know, sitting uh, meditation. And uh, I don't know uh, what else I may have taught you, uh, Tang. Um, all of this happened while Judy was doing a 90-day uh, retreat. So you were a solo retreat up in the mountains in Colorado. So you were stuck with me. So that was, as was I remember, the two most important uh, things that uh, you and I had conversations about. I hope you're still doing it. So, uh, does anyone else have a question? Stan? talking about yoga and Zen coming together, um, but in terms of pranayama, what about how does asana, doing asana practice complement Zen practice? Or asana means posture. And so when we sit, we're sitting in an asana. Um, that's uh, one asana. Another asana is when we're standing and we chant, standing like this, <laughs> that's an actual yoga asana. <laughs> then there are you know, hundreds of other <laughs> yoga asanas, and some of them you have to be a contortionist uh, uh, to do. Um, but uh, you know, yoga as uh, a meditation school uh, was developing around the time of Buddha, and maybe it had been in existence for a couple of centuries, and probably Buddha's initial practice was from teachers in some yoga uh, school. So combining posture with meditation goes back, uh, you know, a, a very long way. Um, the um, main document that survives from yoga as a meditation school, as a philosophical meditation school, is called the Yoga Sutras which is either the first or second century of the common era. In India, you never can get a date closer than a century. And uh, this really surprises me because as a classicist, you know, classicists argue, you know, was it the third day of the second month in, you know, uh, 46 BC, or was it the second day? You know, you want to get it down to the day or the week. And they try to get it down to the century, but, uh, you know, don't always succeed. So the Yoga Sutras consists of 196 uh, aphorisms. Uh, sutra, in the original sense, as, as a as a thread, uh, just as uh, you know, digitally we, we talk about threads, you know, things like that, um, and uh, divided into uh, four chapters. And uh, the second of which is actually samadhi, uh, to give you an idea um, that uh, yoga practice really was uh, a uh, a meditation uh, practice. Um, so the um, asanas, you know, the various uh, postures, uh, you know, are supposed to have, uh, you know, different effects, uh, you know, on you. Uh, but the main thing is, in asana practice is to pay attention to the asana, pay close attention to it. So that's what we're doing, or should be doing anyway, uh, when we sit, always paying you know, close attention to the posture, doing little micro uh, corrections, uh, you know, when, when you see that you, know, you uh, start to slump. 
paying attention to the breath, paying attention uh, to the posture. That in itself is a very strong uh, meditation uh, practice. So thank you for your yoga question. <laughs> yoga, by the way, means uh, unite, come together, become one. Could, could you say something about walking meditation? Oh yes, we also do walking meditation. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so Buddha was always walking around uh, ancient India <laughs> and uh, pilgrimages um, in some Buddhist cultures uh, you know, assume you know, a lot of uh, importance. So when you do a pilgrimage, uh, you, know, you walk to, uh, from one temple to another. And um, you know, this is traditional in uh, Korea during, you know, Heijie. Uh, Kyolche is tight dharma, uh, Heijie between the two Kyolche, the two 90 day Kyolches every year, and two 90 day uh, Heijies uh, every year. And that means kind of loose dharma. So, what's traditional in Heijie is that you walk from one temple uh, to another. You practice in one temple, and then you know, a very long walk, you know, like walking around the block to the other neighborhood temple, but you know, through the mountains uh, and so forth. And so Heijie is uh, a kind of uh, very appealing kind of practice, I think, especially for people who like, like to hike. So during meditation retreats, uh, we always do walking meditation between rounds of sitting. And of course, that has a very practical purpose. Uh, you've been sitting for a long time, you know, you need some uh, relief uh, from that, you know, restore your body and so forth. Uh, but during a walking meditation, you know, we have this uh, mudra and, uh, you know, it's centered uh, right down on your tangent, just like, you know, you know, just like this mudra, when you walk, you know, this mudra. And the idea is to continue your practice uh, while you're walking. Uh, not just to uh, you know look out the window and so forth and uh, just take it easy and um, it, it, your body is getting relief from the asana of sitting. Uh, you're performing a moving asana uh, when you walk. And so it's continuation of the practice. At our old Zen center, uh, we lived in a uh, neighborhood that kind of almost invited uh, not simply walking, uh, you know, around, uh, you know, the, the room, but maybe walking in the neighborhood. And sometimes uh, during a retreat, uh, actually walking to the cemetery. The new Zen Center is closer to uh, the cemetery in East Lawrence than the old Zen Center. So I'm hoping that uh, tradition uh, will continue when we're able to practice live in uh, our new uh, Zen Center. I think the, I don't think it can be more than a half mile uh, to uh, the cemetery. And it's a wonderful practice to walk uh, in a cemetery. Now, there are the dead. There we are going to be. Uh, I don't know if well, some of you, of course, have never even been to Lawrence. I didn't realize that's how it is nowadays <laughs> with our practice. Um, but uh, the cemetery I'm thinking of has many hills. Um, so uh, up and down and around, you know, the paths uh, go and many different, uh, you know, kinds of uh, tombs and, and uh, monuments. Uh, and so uh, I, I look forward to doing walking meditation uh, in that cemetery. And walking meditation in a cemetery takes on, uh, you know, a different tone than walking in the Dharma room or even walking, you know, in, in a neighborhood. Uh, so walking meditation is yet another form. Am I mission, missing another form of meditation? Can someone remind me? You mean that's all we do? We sit, we walk, we stand. Come on, pray. Come on, pray. Enchanting. From I knew there were other things. We did. <laughs> yeah, so chanting. Uh, I think Eileen has uh, something to add to this. Uh, you raised your hand, Eileen. Um, actually, if you're finished, uh, I'd like to ask a little question. I'll finish very quickly. 
we're all familiar with uh, uh, chanting meditation. So chanting meditation is pay attention uh, to sound. So, so the name of our school is uh, Kwan Se Um, Perceive World Sound. So you perceive not only your sound when you chant, but the sound of everyone practicing with you, chanting with you, and also you perceive the sound of the world, the sound of the world's suffering. So that is uh, chanting uh, meditation. Sometimes the words have meaning. Sometimes, uh, as in, say, the great Tirani, they're uh, pure sound. But uh, the direction is always the same. We chant with an open heart, with uh, the mind and spirit of great compassion. Was there another one? There was chanting and kongan practice. Well, you're all familiar with Koan practice. You go into the interview room and the teacher is sitting there and you're walking in and you say, shit, do I have to do this again? Now, that's fundamental to Koan practice, <laughs> which means put down your small eye. As soon as you put down your small eye, everything opens up. And that's the mind that uh, really comes to the fore uh, in Koan practice. Now, how clear is your mind? How open is it? How alive are you are uh, to this moment? Just boom, and cut through. That's the essence of Kongan practice. So Eileen, what do you have to say? Um, on the question of yoga and other forms of uh, practice like Qigong, Pranayama, mm -hmm. you know, I've had this question about how much of this is related to making, because a lot of uh, practices that control the breath, especially, they are controlling the breath. So yeah. Could you comment on this? So to me, it's not entirely natural per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, breathing is actually very natural. Um, we do it all the time. Uh, until we die. So paying attention uh, to your breath, you might think, well, that's artificial. Breathing is so natural, it's not something you know, we should uh, pay attention to. But if you pay attention to your breath, uh, you find that you start paying attention to everything. And that is where this practice uh, really leads. So not simply paying attention to your posture, your breathing, your mind, you might say, but paying, that is training for paying attention to what is before you, moment to moment. So training uh, in and of itself is always, in whatever discipline, somewhat uh, artificial. Uh, it's practice for the real thing, no. this life that we lead you know, with all other beings. If we can pay attention to our practice, we can pay attention to other beings. And uh, that is really what it's all about. Dan, I have a question. This is Carol, hi. Um, um, I always thought of the Kanzeon uh, Sutra that we do in Soto Zen as you know, having to do with Kanzeon. But in the last issue of Primary Point, which is just a wonderful issue, I thought it was just fantastic talking about the, the, the teacher who was in the automobile accident. It says here, as you know, Zen Master Sung Sang chanted the great Dharani all day with very little food or sleep for 100 days, doing his solo retreat when he got enlightenment. The great Dharani is the mantra, which I also love. I love the great Durrani. I just, it, it goes to my heart deeply. The great Durrani is the mantra of the Bodhisattva of compassion, Kwan Seon Bosal. I never heard that before. Did you ever hear that? Yes, I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> and then Master Sung <laughs> Uh-huh. So he, he associates that mantra with, with Kwan, with uh, Kwan Seon? Yes. Um, so that mantra <laughs> is usually regarded as a pure sound. And I think it is. I, uh, yeah, that's how I regard it, yeah. Pure sound. But uh, there are people who have 
uh, you know, sort of saying, well, this is just garbled Sanskrit and we can kind of uh, reconstruct it from the garbled Sanskrit. And you, you wind up with uh, maybe a, a few dozen smaller uh, mantras, uh, Sanskrit words that have uh, actual meaning. Um, and that's not good, uh, you know, uh, not bad. Um, but uh, it is called, you know, the Durrani of great compassion. And if it's the Durrani of great compassion, it's naturally, it's natural to associate it with the Bodhisattva of great compassion, who of course has also. Thank you. That up. Uh, and now we uh, have come to 1130 Central Standard Time, and it's time for announcements. Thank you all for your practice. <laughs>